We often think about our gut microbiome as playing a role in our GI health. And so one of the most common things where you know your microbiome has been disrupted are these GI symptoms. So things like, you know, get diarrhea all the time or I'm constipated all the time. These are all things that are also kind of indicators that your gut microbiome might be, you know, not optimal. And for us women, when we go through menopause, we lose diversity in our microbiome. And that loss of diversity is super important because what it means is a loss of functions. Some of it can actually be rectified by just giving yourself back these microbes. I'd love to kind of start the conversation. I believe most of my li listeners are familiarized with the gut microbiome, but perhaps not with how we start off when we're born, that many of us are kind of inoculated as we're going through a vaginal delivery. I know many people have had C-sections. I had two because I had two big breech kids. But understanding that this is usually the first time that we're getting this swash of exposure to the human microbiome through our mother. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's hard to uh, turn anywhere these days and not hear something about gut health or the microbiome and how important it is for us. And we're real, really realizing it's at the core of all of these different systems in our bodies. And so I sort of think about how in exercise and fitness, at some point, there was this, you know, aha moment when people are like, your core, if you could just strengthen your core, you could do any exercise you wanted. And I feel like we're having that parallel now in the body, which is the gut is at your core. If you could have a, a strong gut microbiome and strong gut health, it will really impact all these other systems in your body. And to your point, it's not about um, necessarily just today, but also where did we start and all the changes that are happening to our microbiome as we um, you know, grow, as we age, and as we go through these different stages of, of biology. And so it all starts um, actually um, in utero. So, you know, we used to think that there were no gut microbes. The utero was completely, you know, when you're in the womb, there is, there's nothing in there um, except for, you know, no bacteria or anything like that. But what we're realizing is that may not be true. There might be some things already starting to happen there. But certainly your first real influx and exposure to the microbiome is um, in the vaginal birth canal. And so if you deliver a baby vaginally, it gets exposure to all of your vaginal microbes. And we know as women that our vaginal microbiome and vaginal health is something that is really important, but it's particularly important during um, pregnancy and during delivery, what are the microbes that are there and, and making sure that the baby gets those exposures. And so if a baby is born via C-section, they don't get that initial seeding of all these different microbes. And so there have been really extreme scientists who have had, uh, you know, C-section babies and then immediately wanted a vaginal swab all over them to try to mimic what it would have been like to have a vaginal birth. Um, I think that eventually we will get to a place where we can do something a little bit less dramatic than that. Um, but, you know, that's really where it starts. And then from there on, it's all about increasing the diversity of your microbiome from mother's breast milk to the first foods that we eat to all of our lifestyle and exposure. It's all about how do you diversify your microbiome to give it as many different functions as possible. Yeah. And it's so interesting to me because I have teenagers now. I'm now in this fun stage. I've loved every stage of being a parent, but helping them understand if they get a round of antibiotics, what the net impact can be on their gut microbiome. And right now they think I know nothing. This is the teenage years where their parents know nothing and helping them understand why it's so important, that lifestyle piece. So I'm certainly not suggesting there's an appropriate utilization of antibiotic therapy used judiciously and for the shortest duration as possible, but helping them understand that they're at a stage in their lives where they're, they've got a much more vibrant gut microbiome than perhaps the stage of life that I'm in where our gut diversity starts to shift and change as we are getting older. And perhaps talking about what are some of the kind of natural fluctuations that you will see when you know, looking at the research throughout a woman's lifetime, obviously the younger we are, we have better diversity. We have sex hormones that can play a huge role, especially estradiol in the gut microbiome and how this starts to change as we're getting older. And by this, I'm, I'm sharing this because I, I find this fascinating. This is not information I learned in undergrad or grad school. And so I, I think it's the more that we understand, the better we can prepare and to ensure that we are making the adjustments in our lifestyle that will make a large impact on our gut microbiome. Absolutely. And I really love that you are doing this podcast and getting everybody educated because the fact is none of us learned about it in school. And the reason is because this is actually a new science. 
things like probiotics and yogurts have been on the shelves since the 70s, but actually microbiome science, if you look on PubMed at all the publications that have come out and you just type in the word microbiome, you'll see that before 2005, it's literally at zero. And then you see this really you know, logarithmic exp uh, exponential growth of all the papers being published. And it's because actually DNA sequencing technologies are what's enabled us to really survey the microbiome. And so now it's really opened up this whole new part of health for us that we really didn't have access to before. So none of us who went to school uh, earlier than 2010 were really even aware of this. And, and certainly even now, you know, there's just new, more new information coming out. Um, I also have teenage daughters. And so uh, I think that, or I also have teenagers, mine are both girls. I just laugh about, you know, how little we now know. There was a time when we knew everything. Now we don't know anything. And later, hopefully they will come back and realize that we might know a thing or two. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's really hard for a teenager to be motivated to think about their health because we can all remember that time where we could eat or drink whatever we wanted to, and we didn't have to think about it or worry about it. And so when you're in that stage of life, you're really not thinking about your future self and, gee, how do I set myself up for future health? Because you can't even fathom not being health, like totally healthy. Um, and so I think, you know, to your point, that's kind of where you're sort of at your most diverse, where you have the most functions in your microbiome. And what happens to us over time um, is that we do start to get depleted in that diversity. And it happens for a variety of reasons. One, to your point, is antibiotic treatment. That is one of the most potent ways to essentially kill all of the microbes in your body. And um, to be very clear, I'm not an anti-antibiotic or uh, people should take them. They save millions of lives, but there is overuse of antibiotics that's happening. And I think that it's really important to know that it doesn't come without a cost. When you take an antibiotic, you really are killing off your entire microbiome. And we know that actually after antibiotics, it takes a little while, but you will reconstitute a microbiome. But it's becoming pretty well known that that microbiome you get after the antibiotic treatment is oftentimes not the same microbiome that you had before. And more importantly, it tends to be a microbiome that helps you hold calories. So, um, Farmers have actually been using this tool for decades where they give their cattle antibiotics, not because they're trying to disrupt their microbiome, but they noticed that they gained weight if they gave them antibiotics. And there have been studies shown um, in children where if you give kids a lot of antibiotics and infants a lot of antibiotics, they are more prone to type 2 diabetes, obesity, even things like allergies and asthma, um, ADHD, celiac disease. They're more prone to all these diseases later on in life because that new microbiome is really not the same as the first one. Um, we know that our diet is the second biggest way that you can change your microbiome. And so the food that you eat is literally the food that you're feeding to your microbiome. And so you are selecting who lives and who doesn't uh, based on what you're, who you're nourishing. Um, and then there are things that are outside of our control that really affect our gut microbiome. So we know just simply as we age, we start to become depleted. We know that when we go through periods of intense stress, we start to become depleted. We know that when we travel and our circadian rhythm gets disrupted, day becomes night, night becomes day, we start to lose diversity in our microbiome. And for us women, when we go through menopause, we lose diversity in our microbiome. So these are all just things that are part of living that can cause us to lose diversity. And that loss of diversity is super important because what it means is a loss of functions. So all those things that your teenage body is able to do really easily, you now can't do those anymore. And so that's why as we age, we start to feel like everything's sort of falling apart. Some of that is going to be the way it is, but some of it can actually be rectified by just giving yourself back these microbes. Yeah. And I think it's so exciting because this is a, a conversation designed to be empowering and informational, not to be scary because let me be clear, and I agree with you 100%, when antibiotics are used judiciously for an appropriate duration, it can make a huge difference in many individuals' lives. I always say with a ruptured appendix, it saved my life, but I had six weeks of antibiotics and antifungals. And I think even five years later, I'm still having to continue to work on replenishing that gut microbiome. Um, and I love that you kind of tied in the nutrition and stress and understanding that when we get jet lag, which some of us do a better job with jet lag than others, I have a much easier time going east than I do west. Uh, and then also the changes that happen as we're making that transition from perimenopause into menopause. Let's back up and talk a little bit about bacteria. I 
always say microbiology ruined my life in a good way, but it made me very aware of the fact there were a lot of species and, and microorganisms that were out there that I was just completely unaware of. Let's talk a little bit about both anaerobic and and aerobic bacteria because this they play an important role in the gut microbiome. They play an, an important role in uh, our digestive system. And there are certain areas where certain types of bacteria thrive and others do not. And sometimes when you get an overgrowth of non-beneficial bacteria, that's where you can start seeing some problems. So kind of from a high level, talking about these basics, because I think it sets the stage for talking about specific organisms later in our conversation. Sure. Um, well, um, when we think about kind of just the biology of our bodies, um, you start to learn and understand that there's different parts to the system that are, are environmentally really different. It's like, you know, going for a hike through different terrains. You're really uh, in, in totally different landscapes from the beginning to the end. So it starts kind of with the air around us, which has a ton of oxygen in it. Um, and when we eat food, there's certainly oxygen in our system, oxygen in our stomachs. Um, but after our stomach starts to digest that food and we start to talk about, you know, the the intestines and where these microbes are residing, your food kind of starts to go down the intestinal tract. And so right on the other side of the stomach, there is still some oxygen there. But actually, as you traverse down this track, this intestinal tract, you start to get um, more and more of a oxygen free environment. And by the time you get to the distal colon, which is where the gut microbiome is, there's actually no oxygen there. And so what happens is that you have these microbes that are sort of on the other side of the stomach that are doing a lot of your work for you. A lot of the lactobacillus and bifidobacterium strains that we see on the market today, they're kind of all along the track there. And so they can be grown in the absence of oxygen. They're not so sensitive. But when you get to the gut microbiome where there's no oxygen, most of those strains there are strict anaerobes, which means that they actually, not only do they not like oxygen, they can't even survive in the presence of oxygen. And so these next generation probiotics that are going to come out are all going to have this different kind of a feature, which is that they're used to living in an environment with no oxygen. And so if you want to be able to manufacture them, take them outside the body and really grow them up and deliver them back to people, you have to figure out how to recapitulate that environment where there's no oxygen. And so um, that's one of kind of the new discoveries, I think, that's going to differentiate the current probiotics on the shelves from the next generation of probiotics. They can't have any oxygen when they're being grown. Yeah. And it's interesting during the, the course of preparation for our discussion, there's one specific anaerobic organism that I knew a little bit about. And I say this openly, I knew a little bit about it, but understanding how challenging it can be to create probiotics or to create these organisms outside of our body and do it in a way with integrity because it is so challenging to grow uh, ana ana anaerobic um, organisms outside of our bodies. It really is incredibly challenging. And, and so perhaps explaining the degree to which you and your colleagues have gone to to be able to create acromancia as an example, uh, to be able to create that outside the body and have it be a high potency product that actually is effective and efficacious. Absolutely. And hopefully we'll dig a little bit into uh, Acromancia mucinophila, the most important strain you've never heard of. <laughs> um, and, you know, really that is the 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 challenge there like i said probiotics and yogurts have been on the shelves for decades when we first started this company we said okay we'll we'll need r d for innovation um and then we'll just outsource uh once we know what strains we want to grow we'll just outsource to these manufacturing companies um to make the strains for us and when we did that i mean and we went all around the globe looking for manufacturers everybody sent us back dead strains because all of the manufacturing out there right now doesn't have this, okay, no oxygen can enter the system kind of a requirement. And so they were growing them in their normal ways of growing them and all these guys were dying. And so what we ended up realizing is that if we really want to, you know, get this company kicked off and we're an early stage startup, uh, every day matters. And so we had to figure out how to manufacture them ourselves. And so we ended up um, having to build our, our own manufacturing plant and an entirely new innovative system for how to grow these microbes where you are trying to mimic their environment. And remember, they're not only, you know, needs to be oxygen free, but these guys are used to being in an ecosystem with a bunch of other things. And so it's like when you have you know, a garden or you're taking something out of a rainforest and you're saying, now I want it to grow by itself, you know, in my kitchen, that is a whole new set of um, environmental factors that you have to take into consideration. So 
we ended up building our own manufacturing plant. And even just keeping these things alive through manufacturing is, is really important. But on the other side of that, the most important thing is that you can deliver these to people. They have to get back to that distal colon. They have to revitalize and they have to perform activities that you want them to perform. So you're taking something out of a system, you're growing it in this artificial system, you're putting it back in and you're saying, do what you, you normally do. And so I think every one of those steps we didn't realize it was going to be a challenge, but every one of them you have to do perfectly if you actually want to be able to deliver people these microbes that give them back these functions. And so it ended up being almost eight years of R&D work that we were not anticipating. That's really an incredible process. And I think for a lot of people, they just assume that when they purchase, let's say, a probiotic off the shelf, that everything in there is still alive and beneficial and helping people navigate making good choices, whether it's probiotic rich food is an example. But I would really love to talk about something that I think is poorly understood. I mean, there are polarizing dogmatic people on social media that will say fiber isn't important, or you know, it, it you can get by without fiber. And I think both of us would agree that there's some degree of bioindividuality. But let's talk a little bit about what fiber, what is its role in the body? Why is it important and how can we, I guess, capitalize on ensuring we are not only consuming the right types of foods that can facilitate the, um, you know, feeding the strains of bacteria in our body that are necessary to be able to have a healthy gut microbiome and what are the things we need to be looking out for? Sure. Well, I think it all kind of starts in, in our caveman, cavewoman days, which is, you know, to to remember that these microbes have co-evolved with us over time. And so um, in those days, it was fruits and vegetables, berries and vegetables that, you know, we had the most access to. And so the vast majority of microbes that are beneficial for our health that we've co-evolved with, that's their food. That's what they rely on. They're not used to seeing processed foods and fake sugars and all of these things that, you know, we've created uh, in, in the last decade or the last two decades. Um, but but that's not, you know, the, the timeline of evolution uh, for these microbes. And so um, these fibers, these high fiber foods are, are really important because they are feeding these strains that then metabolize that fiber and convert them into things that are actually integrated with our own signaling system. And so, um, and in fact, there are certain fibers that our bodies, uh, we actually can't metabolize on our own. So it is, we entirely rely on having these microbes to do that metabolism. And so some of the important things that get produced on the other side of this metabolism are things that help us, um, uh, these are called postbiotics, but things that really help us in our signaling of our gut lining. Um, so butyrate is a really important small molecule. We know that it's really important for colonic health. Um, and, and actually there've been a lot of studies around its role to help prevent colon cancer. Um, we know that these uh, short chain fatty acids that get produced by the microbiome are really important for our gut lining. And we can get a little bit more into that and what it means to have a healthy gut lining and how you know when you don't have one. Um, but then probably, you know, something that people have started to really learn about lately is that um, your gut microbiome also produces these things that stimulate your body's natural ability to produce GLP-1. And GLP-1 is a little bit of a, a hot topic now, although we've known about this small molecule for a long time, we haven't really known all of its benefits. But one of the things that people don't necessarily know is that GLP-1 is actually produced at your gut microbiome. And so if you don't have these gut microbes, your body is not producing GLP-1 and you're getting all these downstream problems of heightened food cravings, you're not getting good metabolism of sugars in your body. And so it turns out that um, you know these the, the fibers that you eat are all super important for feeding these microbes microbes that then help you with your metabolism, help you with your gut lining, which helps you with your inflammation, your immune response, even your gut brain connection. So all of these other systems are dependent on you feeding those microbes. And I'll just say this, which is that I think a lot of the reasons why people start to try to shy away from fibers or try to look for other things is that they're really, their bodies are sensitive to this because one of the things that we've done also to ourselves is we don't eat as many fibers as, uh, you know, we, we, we probably should be eating. Most of us don't. And so you're, because you're not feeding those microbes, they now don't exist in your microbiome. So now the fiber that you're eating, there's nobody in there to metabolize those. And so then you end up getting GI distress. Or you feel like you're really sensitive to fibers. And the fact is that you then end up in this really bad negative loop where then you think, okay, I shouldn't eat fibers. So then you're really not feeding those strains and then just continue to get more and more depleted 
And there's a step in way to start to get access to these strains so that you can start consuming fibers so that you can really feed these microbes and feed all these other systems. Um, and so I'll just give that in terms of why people maybe shy away from fibers, but that they really are helpful for these microbes. And I think that's such an important point. And I, I like to use myself as the example because it makes it a little more tangible when I had six weeks of antibiotics and antifungals, you better believe for at least 18 months, I couldn't eat. I loved vegetables, couldn't eat vegetables, was full carnivore for nine months. And I used to tell my functional medicine doc, I know that the reason why I cannot tolerate this is I my entire gut microbiome was obliterated appropriately given my circumstances. But I think many people will say, well, I have to be you know, a carnivore for the rest of my life because I get bloated. I have digestive distress. I don't feel good when I eat vegetables, fruit, et cetera. And I think it really speaks to the fact that there's something going on that is making it harder for you to tolerate these things, but it's a sign that something is off. And to your point, you're talking about, you know, how many things are impacted by an unhealthy gut microbiome. And from your perspective, what have been some of the signs or clues or complaints or concerns people will express when they are struggling with their gut microbiome not being fully optimized? Well, it's interesting because I think we often think about our gut microbiome as playing a role in our GI health. And so one of the most common things where you know your microbiome has been disrupted are these GI symptoms. So things like um, GI, you know, get diarrhea all the time, or I'm constipated all the time, or I have a lot of gas, or I feel bloated, um, you know, my belly feels distended all of the time. And so there's all these kind of GI symptoms that are signals to you that your gut microbiome, you know, might be not optimal. But there's other things too that we don't necessarily connect to the microbiome. So um, we know that there's this gut metabolism metabolism axis. Your microbes are metabolizing your food. They are a really important part of a healthy metabolism. And so you might find that a GI started to gain weight more easily than I used to, um, or I have these food cravings that I didn't used to have before, or maybe my food cravings are escalating and just getting worse over time. Um, and then even we know that the gut, there's this really important gut brain connection. Your gut actually produces massive amounts of serotonin, GABA, dopamine, and these all go directly to the brain. There's this vagus nerve that literally connects to your gut to your brain. Um, and so as you start to um, feel things like, gee, I feel more tired, I have brain fog, I have this post-lunch slump, and it seems to be getting worse. These are all things that are also kind of um, indicators that your gut microbiome might be you know, not optimal. Yeah. And I think these are important because I think for many individuals, they may have chronic digestive issues that they're like, oh, I have a sensitive stomach. And it could be much larger than that. Or, you know, I'm middle-aged, I'm not getting good sleep. This is why I have brain fog. Or, you know, I'm going through perimenopause and menopause. This is why I'm having these symptoms. And it can be so much larger than that. What are your thoughts on, because I had some questions that came in around, um, you know, greens, powders, uh, you know, polyphenol powders. Are you a fan of these products? Do you think that they're helpful if someone is struggling to get enough? And I'm not saying brands, I'm just going to say greens powders, polyphenol powders. Do you think that they can be helpful if someone is working diligently on gut health? Or do you think it's more important that we're actually consuming the food, chewing it up, swallowing it, and having, you know, going through the whole digestive process as opposed to a powder that's mixed in liquids? Sure. Well, I think the goal is to get as many fibers into your system as, as you can. And of course, um, you know, as we've talked about, the natural way for your body to, to get those is actually through the whole foods. So that produce section of the grocery store where you've got your fruits and your vegetables, you know, that's the the, the best way. Um, now, not everybody can, you know, prep those foods in a way that is enjoyable to them, and not everybody has time to do that. And so there are a lot of reasons why that might be really hard to do. So in that case, um, rather than just sort of th throwing our hands up, there are these, um, you know, supplements and these green powders and, and a variety of actually these different um, mixes that you can, you know, mix with your water. I mean, Metamucil is probably, we're not going to name brands, but that's the, you know, the, the oldest version of this. And now people have started to add other things into those mixes. But um, you know, all of those are beneficial for getting those prebiotics, those fiber, you know, parts into your body and help you boost those microbes. And, and there have been studies showing that 
supplementing things like inulin and supplementing polyphenols can have a beneficial impact um, to your microbiome and, and feeding those bugs. So I would say that whatever tools you need in your toolbox to get those uh, fiber components in is great, starting with, you know, the fruits and vegetables straight from the grocery store, and then going to those powders, if that's easier for you to get them in, um, all of that is better than, you know, kind of doing nothing. Yeah. And I think, you know, when we reflect on the standard American diet and how devoid it is of fiber, for some individuals, maybe having, you know, those polyphenol powders or a greens powder might be a, a stepping stone to eating more vegetables or, you know, finding things that they like and can add into their diet. Now, a concept that was new to me 10, 12 years ago, but has now become much more mainstream for those who are dealing with extremes it, are fecal transplants. And um, I had several questions that came in around this in particular. And certainly when I was rounding in the hospital, I saw a lot of C. diff infection. So people that come in, especially the older population, people that are immunocompromised, they get put on antibiotics and they end up developing an overgrowth of a bacteria that that actually does actually reside in, in the microbiome. And so what has been your kind of evolution on the success rates and the, the importance for some individuals of having an actual fecal transplant, which has tremendous success rate, despite the fact there's a strong ick factor for a lot of people. Yes. So the fecal transplants are exactly as they sound. It's basically getting stool from one person into another person. Um, and and there have been a variety of ways in which people have tried to do that. Um, and you're right. The the first really big, I think, um, indicator that this was going to be useful was for the C. diff infections. Clostridium difficile is a strain that, as you said, many of us have at low levels, and it's no big deal. But you take an antibiotic, you kill everybody off, except for, for some people, there's some of this Clostridium difficile strain that doesn't get killed off by the antibiotic. And then because there's no competitors around, all the food you're eating, it's basically growing and replicating and dividing and taking over your whole gut microbiome. And when that happens, um, it causes you to be really sick. Ultimately, actually, it's fatal. And so you really need to, to treat it. And ironically, actually, the treatment for this, um, which you get from taking an antibiotic, is actually more antibiotics to try to kill the strain. And so there was this whole nother theory that came out, which is, okay, look, if the problem is that you've killed everybody off and now the guy has no competitors, what if we just inundate you with a whole new microbiome? And that was really the, the theory behind the, the fecal transplant. And it turns out it is highly effective. And, and when you're talking about, you know, ineffective is death on the other side, highly effective going from, you know, 70% success to 99% success, you know, is, is, a, is something where you don't worry about the ick factor anymore. And so I think that what that opened up for people and the scientists is this idea of, okay, well, can I use this fecal transplant concept in these other disease states and can I actually help them? So getting outside of that case of Clostridium difficile in infection, can I use it to um, treat all these other diseases? And so these fecal microbiome transplants have been used for um, uh, IBS, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, for IBD, um, which, you know, Crohn's disease, disease, ulcerative colitis. They've been used um, for type 2 diabetes. They've been used for obesity. They've been used for even things like autism people are starting to use them for. And so what you see in there is that if this fecal transplant can actually help with resolution of symptoms and resolution of those diseases, then you know there's something in there that's conferring that benefit. So for us, the evolution of thought was, you know, there's going to be safety concerns around giving people stool. I mean, that's a legitimate safety concern. Um, and as scientists, can we figure out, rather than giving someone the kitchen sink, what are the po components in there that are really helping them and then actually make a, you know, manufacturable uh, product out of that? And so, um, but these fecal transplants were the first indicator that there's something in your microbiome that can cure you. I think it's really fascinating. And, and from my understanding, it's actually the enemas have the highest success rate because, of course, you know, the ick factor is high and, and people were trying to create, I guess, oral capsules, which I can't even fathom that. But uh, for individuals who who need that level of care or have that level of, of illness, I can imagine it could be life shifting for them. Absolutely. And I mean, it's funny because for a long time, the only FDA approved microbiome intervention was stool transplants. <laughs> And so, um, you know, we we really, I mean, and you, all the jokes can come in like, oh, I can't believe we're giving people that shit. Surely we can do better than this shit. <laughs> and so I think, you know, that really sparked a lot of people's interest in how do we deduce what actually is helpful. 
Yeah, I think that's really important. I would love to talk a little bit about the role of the vagus nerve and how it's this, you know, the one of the longest nerves, if not the longest nerve in the body communication between the gut brain, because it's only now that we're really starting to speak up about this enteric second brain, how we have the bulk of our neurotransmitters that are produced in the gut microbiome, why it makes so much sense that, you know, we literally are what we eat, uh, but how much it influences mood, depression, anxiety, as you mentioned, ADHD and all these other factors. Yeah, this vagus nerve and, and this relationship between our gut and our brain is still an emerging science, but a lot of really cool things have been discovered. So first of all, um, as, as you mentioned, we produce things like dopamine, GABA, serotonin, all these important neurotransmitters that um, in, in, in massive amounts, much more than the brain. Um, moreover, uh, and <clears throat> I didn't know this before we started looking into it, <clears throat> You have neurons in your brain. We all know that. And we also, many of us know that you kind of get what you get. As they die, they don't replenish. And so um, that that's sort of when they die, the, the end of that, that life. But you also have neurons in your gut. And the neurons in your gut, unlike the neurons in your brain, they're constantly turning over and replenishing. And one of the like most fascinating discoveries was that these things like Parkinson's and, and Alzheimer's disease, where the hallmark is you start to see these plaques show up in the brain and in these neuronal cells, these are sort of these black plaques that show up. And um, for a long time, I mean, I started my career developing drugs for Parkinson's disease, and we focused really on those plaques in the brain and how can you get rid of them because they're what's kind of causing your brain neurons to not be able to signal to each other. And so you got to get rid of these plaques. One of the most fascinating discoveries was that people discovered that those plaques show up in your gut neurons before they show up in your brain neurons. And so the new leading hypothesis is, okay, if you have these gut neurons and they start to develop these plaques, they're then misfiring signals to the brain and really mobilizing those misfirings to the brain. And so the gut becomes a really huge opportunity to even go after those diseases. And because your gut is constantly turning over these gut neurons, you can actually have a chance at, at fixing them. And so um, it's just a really, really exciting um, field. And then going from Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, which are really diseases of aging, all the way down to autism, which is, you know, really many people think of as a neurological disease that's sort of genetic. Um, one of the most interesting things about autism is that many people will talk about how when they're, they change the diet or they find the optimal diet for their child, they're actually able to reduce the symptoms of autism. And that really points to a gut microbiome role. It may not be for everybody. It may not be for all um, kids with autism, but there is an opportunity here to think about um, if the dietary change is causing a change in symptoms, it is almost certainly going through the microbiome. And so what are these bugs that are actually doing that function that is, um, and, and, and a lot of these studies, they look at um, siblings, where if you have one sibling that is um, healthy and one sibling that has autism, uh, you know, what do their microbiomes look like? And what you can see is that even though they're genetically very similar to each other, their microbiomes actually look really different. And so that's another, I think, really fascinating area of science. No, absolutely. And and for me, it's it's really just reinforcing a lot of these lifestyle measures that the things that we think, you know, certainly as a traditional allopathic trained provider, nutrition was, you know, just follow the USDA gu guide, you know, food pyramid and, you know, close the door. That's as much as you have to think or talk about nutrition. And yet it is so critically important thoughts on artificial sugars. I know there was that article in nature that was comparing, you know, oral glucose tolerance testing and, you know, sucralose and aspartame and saccharin and, and some of these, you know, kind of frequently utilized artificial sugars. What are your thoughts about the health of our gut microbiome and utilizing fake or lab derived sugars? Well, I, it's funny because um, I've since I uh, have gotten to know Peter Atia, and he's definitely a, a fan of these alternative sugars that don't cause these, you know, significant blood glucose spikes, we've sort of been discussing back and forth kind of the, the pros and cons. You know, I think at a fundamental level, because our microbes have co-evolved with us, they're not used to seeing these sugars. And so their ability to metabolize them the same way that they can metabolize naturally occurring sugars, um, you know, is depleted. Uh, and, and so then the question becomes, well, so what, you know, is that really a problem? Um, and, and I think that uh, 
the my understanding from Peter is that the way that people think about these artificial sugars is maybe too broad. So people kind of bucket them all together, but they're actually quite different from each other. And so there may be kind of, you know, gold in those hills where um, a lot of these studies sort of show that artificial sweeteners are really bad for your microbiome. They cause your microbiome to become depleted. But you know, I think what we need to be doing is looking at them at a more granular level because there might be certain ones that are actually beneficial for us. So I would say the jury's still out on on artificial sweeteners. Um, and if they kind of help you reduce the overload of sugar that you would otherwise be getting into your diet, you know, they might have real benefit for, um, you know, your your glucose system. So the 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 publications so far have have shown that these nutritive sweeteners will. Um, these artificial sweeteners will reduce the diversity of your gut microbiome, but I'm not sure that they've been run in maybe the most diligent way. Yeah. And I, and I think if I recall from that nature article, uh, when it came out, I guess it was September of like 2022, it was looking at a mouse model, at least initially. And so it, you obviously being the scientist, you know, sometimes we love to extrapolate rodent data to humans. And sometimes I always remind people, yes, mouse models or rat models are, you know, they are mammals, but we are not equivalent. And so I think it's one of those things where the jury is still out. I think that most, if not all people have a uh, palate that's ex exquisitely attuned to sugar. And so finding ways to reduce the amount of sugar in your life, whether it be artificial or otherwise, is usually my best recommendation. Now, I would love to help differentiate because I think there's a lot of confusion about prebiotics, probiotics, postbiotics, and helping the everyday wellness community to understand how they work together, why they are all equally important, and how we can think about them as a from a systems level. Sure. So um, what we've been talking about here, these bacterial strains, these are the probiotics. And so the probiotics are the strains themselves that perform all these functions. The prebiotics are the food that feed those strains. And so examples of prebiotics are, you know, fibers, polyphenols, and things like that, that feed the bacterial strains and help them to grow. And then what these probiotics do, the reason why we think they're interesting and, and, and why they're important for our health is they manufacture and they produce and they secrete all these small molecules and proteins. And those are the postbiotics. And so, and those postbiotics, those small molecules and those proteins integrate with our signaling system um, and are involved in things like our metabolism, our ability to metabolize sugars, our uh, inflammatory response, our immune response. And so um, the prebiotics are the food, the probiotics are the live strains themselves, and the postbiotics are what they generate. And so at the end of the day, one might argue the postbiotics are the only thing that I really care about. Um, but, you know, just taking those on their own um, are not as effective, actually, as uh, these these other two, the pre and the, and the probiotics. And I think it's important for people to realize that because there's a, there are a lot of what I believe are well-meaning supplement companies that are out there that are creating a lot of these postbiotics. And so, you know, the, probably the one that I think is most well-known is butyrate. And so perhaps helping people understand why is butyrate so significant, you know, especially when we're talking about short change fatty acids, what do they do in the body that makes them so significant and why should we be focused on them? Sure. So butyrate is an incredibly, maybe, you know, one of the most important small molecules that your microbiome generates. Um, and the first thing to know about your colon cells is that they're the only cells in your body that use butyrate as their source of energy. Every other cell in your body uses glucose. Your colon cells use butyrate. And so that means that if you're not getting enough butyrate, your colon cells aren't getting enough energy, essentially, and you're not fueling them. And so you start to have issues with colon health. Um, and then, as I said, there have been a lot of studies linking a lack of butyrate to colon cancer. And so they're really important for your colonic cells. The other important thing about butyrate is that um, it stimulates uh, your L cells to produce GLP-1. And so, um, and, and GLP-1 is an important small molecule that uh, tells your body to metabolize sugars and also um, tells your body that you're full and you don't need to eat any more food. And so um, butyrate is an important molecule. So when you eat food, you have these microbes that produce butyrate, and then butyrate stimulates your body to release these G this GLP-1 molecule, and then it starts to metabolize the sugars that you just ate and tells your body, okay, we're full, and then GLP-1 kind of goes away in the bloodstream until you eat again, and that system you know, repeats itself. And so butyrate is important for your metabolism, it's important for your colon health, it's important for your gut lining. 
The issue with taking a butyrate supplement is really tied to that thing that I said earlier about all the colon cells loving butyrate. And I tell people, you know, would you rather, if I were going to give you a million dollars, put it into a suitcase, deliver it to your front door and hand it to you? Um, or would you rather I called you and said, I just scattered your million dollars all over Highway 101? Um, you would much rather I deliver to you because you know what's going to happen if I scatter it all over 101. Everyone's going to pull their cars over. They're going to grab all your money. By the time you show up, it's going to be gone. And that's literally what happens with these butyrate supplements. You take them while the butyrate is making its way to the receptor that's actually going to do all this awesome signaling for you. Every colon cell is grabbing that butyrate. And so you have this problem, which is a delivery one, that the butyrate never makes it to the receptor. And that's why the efficacy of those supplements is never as good as what we see in the lab and never as good as what you see in animals where you can do that direct delivery. And so it's because everybody's taking that butyrate and doesn't get to the receptor and that's why the probiotics become really effective because the probiotics will colonize literally right next to that receptor. So when they produce the butyrate, it is that direct handoff, that suitcase is going right to the receptor and delivering the goods of the butyrate to it in the right location. Yeah, and it, to me, it's so interesting. I mean, obviously GLP ones, the the exogenous options are now all the rage. I mean, it, it, you know, between you know, interviewing multiple people here on the podcast, talking to clinicians that are prescribing them. I mean, I, it's really having a moment. And my concern is always, what is the net impact on our endogenous GLP-1 uh, secretion mm -hmm. if we are taking these powerful drugs that are designed to hit us really quickly, as opposed to what I would imagine that, you know, when we're talking about this GLP-1 pathway, it's probably a more slow delivery and, and certainly very personalized depending on the individual. Now, what I find really interesting is the role of acromancia with this process as it pertains to butyrate and GLP-1 uh, secretion. And so perhaps we can talk a little bit about that because as I stated at the very beginning of our conversation, I just thought about acromancia as this mucus loving, mucus producing bacteria, and there's so much more to it. Absolutely. Well, we can, there's two, I think, Maybe there's three things to talk about with acromancia. The first is that it was just discovered in the early 2000s um, by Dr. Lee Kaplan at Harvard MGH. He was looking at, uh, he's a bariatric surgeon. And so he was looking at, you know, why do people, what, what are the cause of all these this weight loss and, and really discovered acromancia as, as this important strain. So um, they, since that discovery, the number of publications on acromancia has really been skyrocketing. And so the first thing to know is that healthy people appear to have a lot of acromancia. And when you're lower depleted with acromancia, it's correlated to a wide variety of diseases ranging from IBD and IBS to type 2 diabetes to Parkinson's. And so what has started to um, emerge is that acromancia is maybe a keystone strain. It maybe has an outsized function in the microbiome. So, you know, first of all, acromancia is a keystone strain. The second thing is that Acromancia has this mucin loving component to it. And I think, you know, we, we shouldn't gloss over that. That's actually super important because um, the, the way that your gut lining works is almost, it, it's like a wooden fence where you have these planks, the planks are held together by glue. Um, and what can happen over time is that glue can start to weaken, those planks can start to fall, and that really destroys your fence. Your gut lining is literally the exact same way. You have these epithelial cells, these are the planks, and they're held together by glue, which is called mucin. And acromancia's job, it is the only strain that has ever been discovered whose job it is to regulate that glue. So it takes down the old glue when it gets old, and it actually stimulates new glue production. So it can not only consume mucin, it also stimulates new mucin production. And so its job is to keep that glue strong because what happens is when that glue starts to thin or you have a thinning mucin layer is these planks can start to fall and you lose these so-called tight junctions between your cells. And then you get what a lot of people call leaky gut. But really the effect of it is, is that you don't have tight junctions. You do have sort of these holes between the cells and all the things that your gut microbiome is making can now leak across that lining into your uh, bloodstream causing heightened inflammatory responses, you know, weird immune responses and all these other problems. Problems. And so that gut lining, the core of the gut lining, the only strain that's ever been discovered that regulates the glue is acromancia. So that's the second thing about acromancia. <laughs> it's the, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Um, and then the third thing about acromancia, so it's a keystone strain, it regulates your gut lining. And the third thing is that, um, you know, everyone has sort of known that butyrate can help stimulate GLP-1 production, but um, there have been recent studies that have shown that acromancia 
can directly stimulate GLP-1 production um, because it secretes this protein called P9. This is one of those postbiotics. It secretes this protein called P9, which binds directly to your L cells and stimulates GLP-1 production. Acromancia also produces a short-chain fatty acid called propionate, which can be converted into butyrate, which also binds to your L cells and stimulates GLP-1 production. So it has two different ways in which it can directly stimulate GLP-1 production. And I think the important thing for people to know is that you have these L cells, they're just holding GLP-1 in them. And so without acromancia, they're gonna keep holding them. But with acromancia, we know that it can now tell those cells to release GLP-1 into your bloodstream. And then you get all these benefits of satiety and blood glucose metabolism. And so that's the third thing is acromancia plays an important role in stimulating GLP-1 and in our metabolism. So um, it is quickly becoming in the scientific community, one of the most important strains. And um, there, it's, it's really hard to grow because not only does it have this no oxygen component, but it also has to consume mucin and live in this like weird environment where it's, you know, with the glue and, and all of its role there. Um, and so there have been people trying to market, um, you know, dead acromancia. There are people who are selling acromancia on Amazon that aren't even acromancia at all. And so unfortunately in the supplements business, um, you don't have the same type of tight regulation that you do in drugs. And so for the consumer, when you go into Amazon, I get asked this question all the time. They're like, what about all these other people selling acromancia? We literally have sequenced these things and look into them. And most of them don't even have any traces of acromancia and the other ones have dead acromancia in them. And so um, it's really hard for people who are trying to do the right thing to actually find the right product. Um, and so I'll just give that warning out there to everybody who's going to listen to this and then go on to Amazon and just be like, well, which one should I buy? Right, exactly. And it's interesting. I think one of the things I heard you say is what is fakermancia or, you know, fake acromancia, meaning to your point that you know, there are always people uh, out there that that want to capitalize on the advances that are going on with the gut microbiome. And so, you know, I, I think that this is where let the buyer beware and certainly your company, um, which is Pendulum Therapeutics. And I can now share with the community that one of my cousins has been taking your product and we were having a conversation yesterday and she said, this is the first thing that's helped my gut in 15 years of being on antibiotics. And so I don't take that lightly because she's a physician. And so if people are interested in purchasing acromancia, is it most efficacious to take the supplement? Are there foods that can help with that, that process? I mean, that's the other thing is that I think what I know of things like Concord grape juice and pomegranate juice, there's some properties, but you probably would have to consume quite a bit of it. And it's also juice, which is not necessarily the healthiest thing to consume. Yes. So um, there have been a lot of studies showing that you can boost your acromancia levels with um, soluble fiber, so specifically inulin. And so you can find inulin in, uh, I think, Jerusalem artichokes, also known as sunchokes. They have a really high content of inulin, but also things like asparagus, um, kind of any of your leafy greens that you're seeing in the produce section. So all of those greens, those vegetables, um, you know, can be a good source of inulin that, that help bolster acromancia production. The other um, type of uh, um, foods that can help bolster acromancy are things that contain polyphenols. And so this is a lot of your berries. So pomegranates, um, cranberries, um, you know, all of those have good uh, have good uh, polyphenol counts, but also um, red wine, uh, dark chocolates. These also have high polyphenol counts. And so you can get your polyphenols in some more enjoyable ways. <laughs> um, and then there are polyphenol supplements. So if it's hard to get those fruits and vegetables into your diet, again, um, you know, you can use this other tool, which is to take the, the powder form. We actually did a study across all these different polyphenol um, uh, you know, powders to look at which ones work best with our acromancia. Um, and we found three of them work really well. So we created actually a customized blend of polyphenols to help bolster um, this strain of acromancia. And so um, you can take the acromancia probiotic. And then if you also supplement with foods that are high in fibers and high in polyphenols, that can help bolster, you know, basically feed the acromancia so that it can really start to colonize and grow and flourish. And that's really, you know, looking at it as a synergistic effect. And how long does it typically take when you're taking this Acromancia product to see improvements? Like if someone's having digestive issues, bloating, gas, diarrhea, constipation, is it fairly quick or is it over time that it builds back up? 
Well, I'm going to give the annoying answer, which is that it depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, really varies from person to person. It depends on what your starting microbiome looks like. It depends on what your diet looks like. Um, and it depends on kind of how far along the, the you know, illness that you are um, and, and how far, you know, back you're trying to get your system. And so for some people with GI distress, they we've, we've heard people report within days, um, you know, things are better for them in terms of these GI symptoms. Um, and then for other people, you know, it's five to six months. And so it really does depend on, uh, you know, what your starting point is. And it also depends on whether you're doing this kind of one, two punch of in increasing these things in your nutrition and in your diet while also taking the pills, you know, that can really um, accelerate the efficacy over just taking the probiotic by itself. Um, and so I think generally speaking, though, um, I tell people, you know, give it 90 days to feel an impact. And, and the reason I say 90 days is because we know that if you change your diet, like you go from being an omnivore to a vegetarian, it takes about eight weeks before you see your new microbiome is really kind of established. And so that's kind of doing this really big whole hog change. We're trying to introduce a specific strain or a specific formulation of strains into an existing ecosystem. So give it another, you know, 30% of time. So give it 90 days. Um, and the other reason 90 days is sort of a key number is because um, your hemoglobin A1C cells, which is your measure of diabetes, um, they turn over every 90 days. And so that gives you a chance to actually see an A1C change. So I say give it at least 90 days. Many people feel it much sooner than that. Well, it's such an exciting and emerging field. One last question for you. So for those of us that do quite a bit of travel, as I'm sure you probably do as well, what are some of the things that you do personally to help offset the net impact on your gut microbiome while you're traveling? Um, well, I think, again, you know, it comes to nutrition. It's really easy when you travel to um, slip and slide on that. And I think, frankly, one of the most enjoyable things about travel is the food and the culinary experience of, of things that you're not used to. But if so, to the extent that you can try to be exploring new cuisines and new ways of cooking things that have fibers in them and have polyphenols in them, I think that that's helpful. Um without kind of taking away from the enjoyment of the trip itself. So I think trying to keep those things um, uh, in your diet um, that are that are high in fibers and high in polyphenols is really important. I think the other thing is um, taking these probiotics with you and so that you are continuing, because we know that you can lose diversity, you can lose these strains when you're traveling. And so if you're supplementing and giving them back to your body while you're traveling, that's going to help you kind of stabilize the changes that you're going to be experiencing. Um, and so I think those are really important. And then probably one of the most important factors of people that really disrupts your ability to make good choices is sleep. And so to the extent that you can try to, you know, get sleep, even though there's time changes, I think that's really important. We all experience this. You don't have to have a doctor tell you this, but when you don't get enough sleep, you start to have different food cravings. And then you start down this cycle of, you know, and, and those different food cravings don't tend to be good ones. And so, you know, trying to get good sleep is an important part of having the strength to be able to make good choices in food. Well, and I think those are certainly, uh, you know, items that people can lean into that are certainly very accessible. Thank you so much for this conversation. I've learned so much preparing for this podcast. Please let listeners know how to connect with you, how to purchase your products and learn more about your company. Um, absolutely. So the, the number one place to get more information and to learn about the products is on our website, pendulumlife.com. Um, and there you can learn about all these different strains. And I will say if there's any um, healthcare providers on the call, we actually have a section specifically for you, which goes a little bit deeper into the science, which also goes into the clinical trials that we're running and, and calling for. And if you are not a healthcare practitioner, but you're like me, you love science, uh, please go to that part of the website as well. Um, and you can purchase um, all of our different products uh, on the website. And actually, I think we have a code for your listeners today, which is Thurlow, which gets people 20% off the first bottle of membership. Um, but you can also purchase these products on Amazon, uh, on walmart.com. And um, if you are a practitioner, we also sell them on Fullscript, which is a platform for, for practitioners. So, but our website, pendulumlife.com is where you're going to get the most information. We really welcome feedback and questions. The microbiome is a new science. We want to learn from you too, what you're experiencing. And so i um, really excited to uh, have this podcast come out and, and have more people come to the site and learn about the microbiome. No, I, I, like I said, I learned a lot while preparing for this. And I think that, you know, this is one of those opportunities for people to really better understand why diversity in our diet is so very important. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. 
Hey, if you like this video, you guys are going to love this video and I'll see you there. You have either uncontrolled diabetes, and this goes for type one, type two, LADA, MODY, any form of diabetes. If, if you follow the standard, if you follow no advice, you're probably gonna uh, hasten your death even more than three and a half years for each decade you have it. But if you follow the standard advice, the state of the art advice, the scientific consensus advice, then yeah, you're probably gonna be knocking three and a half years off your life for every decade that you follow the American Diabetes Association recommendations.